Welcome, good morning, good day, everyone. Uh, as as I, I guess I already got introduced. So my name is Alex. I'm based out of Germany. I'm working at Autodesk as a product guy, product specialist for 3ds Max. And I would like to to take this opportunity for the next like 60 minutes uh, to give you some overviews on you know design uh, visualization workflows within 3ds Max 2016. So for, for me to you know, quite hard to, to, to see who is working with which uh, 3ds Max version, but uh, I'm assuming, you know, not, not everyone has seen the latest version of 2016 or not everyone has, uh, you know, switched to 2016 already. But uh, again, we will do a little bit of an overview um, on some tips and tricks that are available to, to previous versions of 3ds Max as well. So uh, let me switch back to my PowerPoint here. Oh, that's me. Uh, so, so I didn't have a webinar, uh, a webcam connected. So I thought I would post in uh, a picture of me. Uh, and uh, the the next one, as Thomas mentioned, it's it's quite cold. Uh, I also put this one in here. So I don't know who, how many of you, you know, have read the books or have seen the TV series Game of Thrones. Uh, why is that in here? Well, it's it's getting pretty pretty cold everywhere in Europe and. Uh, Game of Thrones is a very good example of a 3ds Max production where, you know, there are three production houses in Europe who are producing Game of Thrones, who are doing all the 3D work. And this is all done inside of 3ds Max, which makes the product quite appealing uh, towards all different sorts of industries, really. And this is one of the reasons why now this year in 3ds Max 2016, there is no difference between 3ds Max design and 3ds Max anymore. So all of the people who have been used to work in, on 3ds Max design, they now have the full feature set of, of 3ds Max. So this includes the, the SDK and all the people from 3ds Max have all the functionalities from 3ds Max design, which is civil view and lighting analysis. Uh, I guess that caused a lot of confusion uh, in the market and on forums and in tutorials, etc. So uh, just rest assured, you have now one you know, big package back again, uh, which is just 3ds Max 2016, uh, serving all those different industries out there. Before we hop into the scene, into 3ds Max itself, uh, I want to thank Delta Tracing who provided us with content. So this is an exterior scene as well as an interior scene that we all, um, you know, take a closer look at, which is basically a kitchen scene. And into that kitchen scene, I'm going to import some, you know, additional furniture, some some uh, models or products like this this mixer, for example. So let's hop over into 3ds Max. What's actually new about 3ds Max design, uh, not 3ds Max design, but 3ds Max 2016 in the design field is this welcome screen. I believe we introduced that in 26, uh, 2015. On the left-hand side, you will see some, you know, mini startup videos. That's especially nice for for those of you who are coming from a different product like Revit, etc., and they want to just, you know, dive into the workflow of 3ds Max. These one-minute product um, overviews give you a good understanding of how to navigate the camera, how to, you know, um, yeah, get get through stuff like setting the lights, uh, editing your geometry, applying materials, etc. So that's that's pretty cool. What's also new is uh, are these startup templates. And 3ds Max 2016 ships with a number of startup templates, but this is just to give you a basic understanding of what's what's happening there. Basically, what's what's really powerful about that is the template manager. And here you can define your own Max scene with you know, all the render presets that you usually use for an indoor scene or for a studio environment or outdoor scene. And this is absolutely renderer agnostic. So that means whether you're using V-Ray or Mentoray or Corona, it doesn't doesn't matter. The template manager doesn't doesn't care. You just set up the scene as you wish. You can pre-populate it with whatever content you want to use over and over again and make that template available inside of your team by using the export and import buttons down here. Cool, I hope that that makes makes sense. Then the next new thing is the design workspace, which you can see on the top left corner right there. So here we have a new ribbon and I've switched to the design workspace by, you know, just getting back from the default workspace up to the design standard. 
And the ribbon guides you through importing your geometry, doing a little bit of measurement and setting your units up to basic modeling, setting materials, populating the scene with additional um, geometry, with additional props, as well as characters and then it goes over into lighting and rendering so basically there's no new functionality in here but uh, instead of looking through all the different menus inside of 3ds max you now have everything right at your fingertips right so it's collecting all those different uh, different operators and putting them into that design ribbon right there if you go into import then you'll see that the, the list of importable 3D data is, is quite relevant, quite huge, basically. And this is one of the core features of 3ds Max, has always been one of the core features of 3ds Max, that we try to import as many 3D objects and, and file formats as possible. What's new, and this is, you know, you can't see that in by, by popping up this scene, but this, this list, what's really new is that all of these imports are now powered by the Autodesk Translation Framework, which basically is the next evolution of the Direct Connect int interpreter. So you can now natively import SOLIDWORKS data, CATIA data, uh, even Revit files without having them converted to FBX. And this includes stuff like, if I switch back to the, the PowerPoint, stuff like inventor data, which again can be natively Im imported, but including driving animations. So if you have these, yeah, co complex or simple animations, doesn't doesn't matter too much, uh, then you can import them right away from inventor, right? So, so this is something that I've done here. I'm going to use my XREF objects in order to hook up the, that kitchen mixer right here. So let's jump, put that into the scene. There it goes. It has the animation on there. And if you select the material that's on that mixer, because it's an extra external reference, we now have an additional node that enables me to override the material. So that means I, it, I can, at any point, I can still use the original material that is linked back in the, in the external reference, in the external max file, or I can choose to override that and basically make that, you know, color blue, for example. And then if I come back in here and enable and disable the override, you will see that uh, I still maintain the connection to the original material, but again, I can use my own on top of that. So that's, that's quite useful. Okay, if I get back up uh, in here and I'm going to disable the, the ribbon just to make up some, some screen space. The next thing I want to use is uh, the select and place feature. And I don't know if, how many of you have used that or even seen that because it's in there since 3ds Max 2015, so since last year. But it's basically up, the, up here in the translation methods. So you've got select and move, rotation, scaling, and then there's this new button called select and place. And this allows you to quickly select uh, geometry in your scene and move them over into, you know, from, from even one viewport into the other. But basically, it's like an auto grid where you, or, or like, a, like a surface snap, where you can quickly, you know, lay down geometry on top of other geometry, right? Just like this. And I can even uh, hold shift to copy and paste and stack up these, these books, for example. Right, and you might have noticed that this class that you know intersects with with a table right there, and this is because the class has its pivot points set to its center, right? So we can get in here and either adjust the pivot point, or we can do a right click on that select and place feature, and use instead of the pivot itself, we can use the base uh, of the object as the pivot. So that's kind of the bounding box of that object. Another great feature is the auto parenting. So that means if I switch that on, if I move that class, for example, on that tray, that this is now automatically linked to the geometry that I've placed it on. So I can select that tray, you know, and move that around and have the class attached to it. 
And that feature has been co-developed with the IKEA, the whole select and place functionality. And they are using exactly that functionality to, you know, quickly dress up their scene, uh, get their kitchen or uh, dining rooms ready in place and just, you know, drag and drop stuff out of their model library into, into your scene. So that's that's kind of useful. All right. So the next big feature that is available to you inside of 3ds Max 2016 is the so-called Max Creation Graph. And this is something that's available to you in the scripting dialog. So here we got Max Creation Graph Editor. Uh, but basically here you can also install pre-made MCG or Max Creation Graph packages. And those packages are available by well, other users who make them available on ScriptSpot, on our 3ds Max Creation Graph uh, Facebook site, as well as on the area. And there are hundreds of those already available. So, so that's, that's pretty useful. So what does the Max Creation Graph do? It's basically a graphical um, programming interface, which enables you to create your own procedure modifiers, your own procedure objects, as well as your own procedural animation controllers. Do I want you to learn the Max Creation Graph? Well, not necessarily, because it's basically, even though it's a visual rec representation, so it's like uh, you know, drag and dropping stuff over into your into your scene. If I have a new Max Creation Graph open, like this, even though that's a graphical representation, it's still programming, right? It's still very technical, but it's the message is that you can download stuff for free, and then you can open that up and see instead of having a script or a compiled plugin, you have full control over what the, the Max Creation Graph is doing. So for example, if I, uh, let me let me check the time. Yeah, okay, so if I come, come over here and, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, there we go, so here I got some kitchen knives. Let me say I, am, I would like to, to procedurally translate or copy those kitchen knives over to the right-hand side, right? Procedural means that I can, at any point, change the original uh, kitchen knife, you know, and have all the changes translated over there. So what I can do is I can go into my modifier stack on the right-hand side and use, for example, one of these clone modifiers that I've created with the Max Creation Graph. So uh, I could say I want to have uh, four kitchen knives along the, let me see if that works. Um, okay, so, so that, this one doesn't work. So, so the, <laughs> the thing is about the Max Creation Graph, whenever I demo that, I create one of these clone modifiers. Some of them uh, well, might be broken, so let me try the next one. <laughs> let me try this one. Oh yeah, there we go. We got everything hooked up like this. So see what I mean? Uh, you can procedurally ch uh, change the whole appearance of these kitchen knives. You can even scale them down uh, and move them over a little bit further, move them up a little bit, just like that. Okay, so that that's that's enough. And I can I can at any point I can come in here and change some of the you know a little bit of the overall appearance of these kitchen knives. Uh, let me scale that down, bring that up or down. See what I mean? It's all, all there. And this, you know, don't, this doesn't have to be kitchen knives. This could be uh, lampposts in a, in a city or some, some other stuff. We basically, basically took that clone modifier and we put it on top of that thing over here. So what is that? That's a window blind, a window blind with a lot of different settings, as you can see here. So I can adjust the window blinds, how many I want, how uh, uh, wide or how high the, the window should be. And because all of these parameters are available inside of 3ds Max in my modifier stack, I can use the wire parameters and hook that up to other objects. So here I got that string, as you can see here, and if I pull that string, these window blinds will automatically open up and close down. And I have that cylinder, which I can use in order to control the, or the, the rotation of these windows, window blinds, just as I would do in, in a real world. Okay, 
and this is you know that's that's a little bit playful I mean that's 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 fun to have but just imagine that you can hook that up to for example the daylight system so whenever the, the sunlight travels by um, arrives at noon on that that side of that window you could have the window blinds automatically be lowered lowered down like this and there's another example in this very scene and this is the uh, the store set here over here this has been I believe created by a Brazilian, if I'm not not totally mistaken, by a Brazilian customer, and they made they made that available as well on uh, on the net on the internet, you know. And you can adjust the overall appearance of of these doors. You could even uh, select the the door itself. And as you can see here, when I move that away, the hole stays in that in that wall. But because we hooked that up with an AEC door, as soon as I let go, the 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 hole in that that wall will automatically be recreated, just like that. So this this is all about you know procedure workflows and and making rapid changes to your scene uh, like like that. Another great thing about visualization inside of 3ds Max, as I mentioned before, you know, it has been used in Game of Thrones, it has been used in Star Trek, it has been used by by Ubisoft and Rockstar you know, to create recent game game titles. Because of that, we have a full functional 3D environment, including visual effects, and we can use these visual effects in order to create additional emotion in our scene. So let's say we want to render out this this kitchen scene, and let's say we have light shafts coming in from the outside. I would like to visualize some dots of dust in whenever wherever the light is. All right. And these dust points they can be um, well created using the particle system. All right. So um, let me let me close that window blind like that because there's another one as well. So let's open up the particle flow. Mm. I totally understand that you know the particle flow itself. That's a whole other system inside of 3ds Max, and it can get quite complicated. But then again, it's it's another visual represent, representation of your particles. It's an event-driven particle, and the magic of using that for design visualization is uh, being aware of these presets that are available down here. So if you just track and drop the preset flow into that scene. You have around 100 different different preset flows available. Those are categorized via different elements. So we got air, earth, fire, water, and then the the fifth element, which is apparently logo animations, <laughs> which is yeah fun to have that um, have that in here. But if you have a look at, for example, the air, here you have stuff like a flock of birds. So if you have want to have some some birds in the background, sure, you can do that. Just just track and drop that particle preset in there. Or we have uh, a water fountain or waterfall, etc. All of that stuff is is pre-made in here. And there's also a water snow template, which I'm going to use uh, to create that kind of dust. So if I quickly isolate that view, uh, and I don't know how fast that translates over the web, but you will see that, or hopefully you get the idea that this snow is moving and it's falling quite, quite, uh, quite fast. So in order to have that simulating dust, all I need to do is move away from that gravity. And uh, for now, I'm going to disable this one and go back into my next state. So here I have that snow template without gravity. So I don't know if you can see that, but basically those particles are just staying in place and they are rotating and they are way too way too big at the moment to represent us, but you know, we can lower down the, the size later on. So let me get back into the, my particles. So the next thing I want to do is adding a little bit of wind into that scene. So I have this force event and I have a few wind space warps that I've created previously. There we go. Now I have a little bit more, you know, variation between these particles. That's good. 
And then again, you will notice that those particles, they are all over the place right now. So if I close that down, you will see, wow, that, that's quite messy. <laughs> Just imagine that we have these light shafts coming in like this in a diagonal um, streak. And I only want to have these dust particles visible in within that light shaft, right? In order to achieve that, I need to create another a uh, little collision object, which is this particle box. So that's just a box that I've scaled down on one side. If I come back in here, see through, there we go. You will like actually see, I want to use that, bo that box as an occlusion object for my particles. So basically, I only want the particles to appear within that box. How to do that? Well, basically, you get back into the particle flow. And then we use something called a data operator. And this might not be the apparent to users who haven't used particle flow for a while, but we integrated particle flow toolbox two and three into particle flow. And particle flow toolbox two it gives you volumetric collisions and volumetric, like a fully physical particle system. And particle flow toolbox three gives you that data operator, which basically enables you to, you know, <laughs> create your own particle systems within another visual programming interface. But remember, I don't want you to get too involved in that kind of programming stuff, etc. Uh, all I want you to do is use presets. So within that data operator, there's another preset, which I'm going to use, and this is called light beam. So I'm going to use that light beam, which enables me to pick a box or an, any object, really. Uh, there we go. And now we got those particles only visible within within that, that box, just like that. So I don't know if you can really see that, but I'm going to scare or to, to hide that box again, if I can find it. There we go. So now we got those particles only flying around in that in that geometry. And I can change the geometry on the fly. So if the, the light travels, then I can you know scale or adjust the geometry of that box. And uh, as promised before, we can go back in here and change the overall size of, of these dust particles. You know, just scale that down. And now we got a subtle appearance of these dust particles. Still a little bit much, so maybe we want to change the you know, a, amount of dust that's in that scene, but that's that's how it's done. Great. So the next tip would be if we go a little bit further into that scene. Here's a rendering uh, delta tracing did, and you will see that there's this bread with a kitchen cloth on top of it, and and cloth. You know, that that's something that you can use over and over again for curtains for for. A tablecloth like this, or for a, um, um, a living room scene, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so cloth is kind of important for visualization inside of 3ds Max. But there are some tips and tricks on how to quickly adjust the cloth on on top of other objects. And basically, this is something I want you to sh want to show to you. So here I have these objects prepared. I have the bread as well as the the tablecloth. So I'm going to whoop, move that on top of, <laughs> if I can catch it, there we go. Move that on top of this one. And I have an M cloth modifier on, the, on, the, on this one. So we have two different modifiers, the cloth system and the M cloth system. And the M cloth system is a little bit more simplified, but it's enabling you to interact with the mass effects objects. So if I go into the Mass Effects toolbar, I can basically select these two objects right here and enable them to be kinematic rigid objects. Kinematic, kinematic rigid objects allow you to be animated or being, you know, moving or yeah, move along along the timeline at any at any point. And I have the, you know, that that kitchen uh, shelf, whatever. Uh, kitchen table. So I want to have that as a static rigid object. And then all I need to do is uh, ac activate the gravity, which was for some reason in that scene, it's, it's deactivated. Usually there's a default setting in there. Going back into my cloth, I can enable the life dragging. And it's going to fall down on my 
on my bread. And then I can, you know, adjust, this, adjust it like this. Again, I don't know how, how fast that translate, ten translates over the, the internet, but you probably should say that the cloth doesn't behave like a cotton or silk or whatever, like a, like a fine cloth, tab a tablecloth, but, but more like a plastic sheet, <laughs> I, would, I would say. So in order to change that, remember the, the topic with the presets. There's another preset in here, which is called cotton. So I'm going to enable that or load that in, go back into live dragging. Uh, there we go. Whoop. And there we go. Now I have much more, you know, wrinkles in that in that tablecloth, like like this. So that's not too bad. And I could even come in here and capture that as an initial state select my bread and go into play right here. And now I can move that bread around and, you know, it just, whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> there it goes. Um, it just all of that. And as soon as I'm happy with the, with the overall look and feel, maybe I want to have something like that. Don't know. I can, put a shell modifier on top of that and a turbo smooth modifier and convert it down to an edit poly. And now I have, you know, one object that I can just render out like this. Talking about placing your objects or creating geometry, there's another great technology that's now imported or a part of 3ds Max, and that's Pixar's open subdivision uh, smoothing. So it's, it's basically like a, Furtherly developed Turbo Smooth, if you or like a smoothing algorithm. So I don't know how many are aware of, of OSD, Open Subdivision Technology. But I'm going to isolate that kitchen sink right there. And uh, let me first disable all these modifiers on top and just put a Turbo Smooth modifier on top of that. So the Turbo Smooth behaves as you would expect with a geometry that is tessellated like this. So this is a very basic low polygon uh, kitchen sink. As soon as I have the turbo smooth on top, everything is going to be smoothed out. But if I wanted to have a little bit of a hard surface edge smoothing, what I need, what I would need to do is go back into the base geometry, uh, select these edges, you know, and start chamfering them out, which is working, kind of, right? So, so I can just just chamfer it like this. And then apply the turbo smooth on top of that in order to create more like a like a yeah soft soft edge. And by the way, the chamfering also supports quad quad chamfer by now, so it's always creating quads for you. So that's that's pretty cool. But as soon as you do that, you are losing flexibility, right? You're losing flexibility in order to adjust the overall look and feel of your product. So if you have uh, a customer who's kind of kind of picky about the visual style or the appearance of his products or the, the overall scene. Um, open subdiv is something that comes in really, really handy. So if you just put an open subdiv modifier on top of that, it's, it's going to use or be at the same, uh, give, give you the same output as the Turbo Smooth. The magic lies in that preset modifier down down below. So, and the preset modifier allows you to just select your edges and adjust the crease amount of these edges on the fly without changing the underlying topology. Right. So you have full control over the visual look and feel of your of your objects just by adjusting the crease amount. And I could even, you know, because it's a crease set modifier, you can create additional crease sets. So here I have the, uh, let me see, the sinkhole selected. I can create a crease set for that and have a round sinkhole like this and another set of, of curve curvature for the outer sink like this. Cool. All right, so, so just give it a try. You know, the, the open subdiv, that, that's pretty cool. Uh, you can bake down these crease um, settings down to the edit poly. So the edit poly stores these crease sets. You could even define the crease sets within the edit poly itself. And then you can transfer it back to 
uh, Maya to Mapbox or some other 3D software that's able to rate crease amounts for open, uh, Pixar's open subdivision technology. So, that, so that's, that's a pretty cool implementation right there. Cool. If you wanted to go into animations, right? You, you, we see a lot of animations being created inside of 3D Max, wherein you build up an, an object. You build up a room and then you create or scale up the, the furniture in that room just to, to make the overall look and feel of the animation a little bit more appealing and, and not that intimidating, I would guess, because if, if I just render an animation of that scene, it's pretty pretty full with you know lots of props in that scene. So what I'm trying to say is that there's a new way of, of pulling objects into your scene and revealing objects in your scene. And that way is done or driven by animation presets. So you can, with the, the extension one of 3ds Max 2016, you can create your own animation presets basically just by animating one object and then storing that anim object's animation as a preset. And this allows you to load in that animation on top of other objects just by you know, selecting them and click on load, load preset. So how does that look like? I may, mm, let me get rid of that thread maybe. No, that, that should work. Okay, so, so there's no animation in that scene. But what I want to do, and I have a selection set for that, if I can find it, yeah. So we have a few geometries selected, these, one, these ones. And I would like to scale them up over time. So maybe um, start here or start on that side of that uh, table and just make those geometries appearing. So I'm going to load a preset that I've created earlier. Uh, this is called Scale Up. I'm loading that in. And as soon as I've done that, you know, all these objects are disappeared and they scale up like this over time. Right. And again, I don't know how well that, that translates, but these scale animations, they also wobble a little bit. And this is achieved by just putting a flex modifier on top of the scale animation. And this is all driven by that preset. So it's, it's automatically offsetting that keyframed animation for you and what's what's magical is that this is all stored in that you know modifier right there and you can offset the animation a little bit differently let's close that down uh so let's say i want to have a per node delay of four or three and now we have all those animations more or less you know happening well not exactly at the same time but very close to each other within three plus a random, you know, of, of up to two keyframes difference. And you could also start over here. So at the magazines, just by picking that object. And now the magazine is starting and all the other objects um, are going to be created based on that distance, right? So this is the animation offsetting and animation presets method that's now available to you inside of the Rismax. 2016 extension one. So just make sure that you've downloaded the latest extension. And what's also part of that extension, if I come over there, is uh, unhide all. There we go. A 3D text object that's totally new to 3ds Max. So we had 3D text before, or 2D text, which could be extruded. And now you got this new object called text plus. Right, and the text plus object gives you a whole, you know, set of additional functionality. For example, and I have to move that live webinar out of the way. There we go. And for example, you can mix different uh, fonts and text sizes within one object. So I could select the distance and change that to two different fonts like this. Okay, then I can come in here and say, I would like to manipulate the text. This gives me the ability to scale words up and down, or I can even move text on a letter per letter basis. So I could have floor like this, move this one there. I don't know, stuff, stuff like this. Right. And everything, you know, all the changes you do right there, those can be animated as well. So just hit 
the animate button, the auto key button, and you're good to go. So that's that's pretty 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 powerful. Yeah, and believe it or not, the the offset animation system that I've just showed you that's part of that text initiative. So you can animate the whole text based on its letters and just you know make text fly in like a, like in a Star Wars movie or scale up like we saw with the with the dishes. Uh, we also see that value, so we can open up um, or or set a value as text, and this is basically an expression that we're using right there. So if I'm moving down the, the the frame like this, the text automatically changes. And another thing people have been asking for is uh, they want to be able to edit the text in a large editor. So if you're you know working a lot with text, this is a, is a life saver because they have a of a full text editor in here. You can copy paste stuff from your WinWord document. The, the clipboard will automatically maintain the fonts that you were selecting in your WinWord document and use them in your 3D text object inside of 3ds Max as well. And then finally, and um, I know not everyone's working with text, but I'm a little bit excited about this uh, you know, new feature set. You can either generate just a 2D splines or you can extrude it automatically. And on top of that extrusion, you can uh, start to bevel your stuff around. So I can you know, bevel one side, if I can just select that. Um, you can just bevel one side of the geometry or you could even uh, in your advanced parameters bevel both sides of the text like this. And if you're not satisfied with the way it's it's being beveled, you can open up the bevel profiler that's inbuilt in that tool and change the overall look and feel of, you know, of your bevel. Save that down as a new preset. So let's say this is my 3ds Alex preset. <laughs> and the next time you come in here, you will have your uh, 3ds Alex preset in in there, right? So you can switch back and forth between those. Yeah, that's the 3D text that's that's in here. Uh, and then there's a very good, a well hidden feature inside of 3ds Max that is part of that 3D text. Um, imagine you have a 3D object where you would like to have 3D text appear on a on a curvature. Like basically what you want to do is just use a texture, a texture map uh, and put that on top of your object. Well, you can transfer these 3D texts into a texture map on the fly by using the material editor. If you come in here uh, into your materials, standard maps, there's a new map called text map. There it is. And the text map allows you to just pick a 3D text object and will automatically create that text map for you. This could be used as an alpha cat out, cut out, or you can even animate that text map. Uh, you can use it as a composite map, you know, to, to do all sorts of stuff. So yeah, that's that's pretty cool. And again, a well hidden feature. Uh, a lot of people, even with an Autodesk, don't know about about that one. And here's a quick video. Again, I I'm not sure how how well that translates over on the, onto the web. But here we have that text object wired up to this, you know, to these sliders and yeah, and have it automatically change <laughs> its appearance, you know, and it's being rendered down to, to a texture map as well. Fantastic. Cool. So we got 15 more minutes to go. Um, I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I'm pretty much good to go with that, with that scene, but I want to show you a different one as well. And here I have an exterior that, which I'm just going to load up. Uh, let me, let me see. And I'm not sure if there are any questions in between. I've, I might have missed. So, okay, cool. No, we should be good. Um, Perfect. Yeah, if you have questions, just just let me know. Uh, so I don't have that question panel open up all the time, but I guess Thomas will, will will tell me whenever something comes up that you need to be uh, to get an answer to. Yeah, exterior exterior visualization. So we have this scene where we imported some some Revit buildings. Uh, so so the Revit import, by the way, is much faster now in 2016 and much more robust. What happened prior to 2016, whenever you imported Revit files, um, well, internally, it would convert them to an FBX file. 
So, and, and just just imagine you would import a Revit 2014 file, right? So, so what would 3ds Max 2015 do? They it would open up a non-user interface version of Revit, like in the background. Then it would convert the 2014 Revit file to a 2015 Revit file. Then it would export that as an or convert it to an FBX and import it into 2015. That what was what made the whole process of natively importing Revit files in 2015 really, really slow and painful. Now in 2016, you have a native import of Revit without the conversion of FBX files. So that's that's really straightforward. Cool. Uh, and I believe I have a, a Revit file file linked into that scene. Yeah. So so here's my my one of the Revit buildings that's that's currently file linked into into my scene right there. Perfect. So what I wanted to show you you know, besides systems like the like the populate system where you can easily create characters into your scene, which is very, very useful. What you also have right at your fingertips is the civil view. The civil view extension was only available to people who had been running the 3ds Max design version. So for everyone else who's you know coming from a more 3ds Max without the design background, uh, for all of those, uh, for, for, for all those, the civil view is a new feature now in 2016. So I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but it's it's pretty much a new feature. And even uh, I'm I'm meeting a lot of people who who are running 3ds Max design, but they are not using civil view because, yeah, let's let's just be honest, it's it's a whole package within Max to place your traffics and place your objects into a scene. It's a little bit can be a little bit awkward to get your head around at the first time you, you start with it. And quite honest, uh, you know, frankly, I, I thought that this is a connection to civil only. So so only if I have if I would be running auto to civil that I could use that. But it's it's not true. So even without any civil files, I can use it to, for example, create road markings on that street. So we here I have a little spline. Everything is spline based more or less in, in that civil view, which makes it quite you know procedural in a way so if you are changing the the overall look of that spline all the objects that are assigned to that spline will move along as well so let's go into that road marking editor i'm going to add a new element based on that shape right there and let's say the width of that road marking should be five centimeters and i'm going to hit apply and now we got that you know white line as a road marking. I can copy that and paste it on top and have a dotted line next to it. So in that case, I would need a mark length, let's say two meters, and a gap length, I don't know, two meter 50. I, I'm not sure about the, the actual standards of, of these road markings, to be honest. But yeah, let's offset that horizontally by minus 10 centimeters. And now we got road markings on our on our street, just like that. And still, you know, you should be able to select this spline that's underneath, if I can get it, there we go, and change that spline. I know, I know, you know, that's a little bit of a bad example because it's just a straight street, but this could be a roundabout, this could be a curved, a curved um, road, even a road that goes up and down, etc., and it will automatically adjust these road mark markings for you based on that spline. So I have that spline selected, and the next uh, step I would like to add is traffic, and this can be done in the object placement and style editor. Uh, and it's also automatically, you know, recognizing that I have a shape selected, asking me if I want to reuse that, sh that shape, I'm saying yes, yes, please. Uh, and now I can, you know, add furniture, which is uh, light poles, uh, trees and plants, traffic signs. All of that stuff is basically shipping. There are two different standards. One is a European standard. One is the um, an American standard for all these road markings. So it should work for for us over here. And what's what's really cool is that it, it features a number of different cars that you can use as well. So we have 16 cars, uh, which I'm going to use randomly. So I'm going to randomly use, you know, some cars out of that uh, that section, and I would like to make them appear on my streets. Maybe just three cars for now. 
moving quite slowly at 30 kilometers an hour, hitting apply, and those cars will automatically you know, uh, appear just like this. Okay, so I might want to move them over like one meter 50, uh, just like that. Yeah, there we go. So that, that's pretty cool. And you can use that, right, uh, um, to, to place your own objects as well. So you can have customized libraries of objects and place them into your, your civil library. Uh, do you wish to save? No, that's all right. And let me show you one more thing, and that's the Civil View Explorer. And uh, as soon as that's opened up, uh, it will I will it will, sh it will show you that you have full access over whatever has been created already. So that means I can select that vehicle, and I can adjust its position down on that spline. I could even come in here and change its, you know, change its material like that, etc. So these are just, I believe, standard materials, but you can convert them to V-Ray shaders uh, with, uh, you know, a simple conversion script, etc. Or if you're using Mentoray and want to use the Mentoray car paint shader, you can do that as well. Yeah, so that's the Civil View. I believe I have another, yeah, Civil View complete right there. So here we, have, here we are using one of these custom objects this is a populate character who's riding the, the bicycle. <laughs> and it's just, you know, part of that civil custom library. <clears throat> so th that's, that's quite useful. Great. Yeah. Another website that I want to quickly feature or at least mention, you know, we, we have very, very useful libraries out there on, on Tobasquid. Evermotion has their own shop. Uh, but Creative Market is another one that now has a very deep connection to 3ds Max. Uh, it's, it's being, you know, maintained by Autodesk. Uh, and basically what it allows you to do is create your own market, share your assets with other users, basically sell your assets. And you can also filter for assets directly out of 3ds Max and search through Creative Market and you know, just just buy some assets down down from there. It should all be linked in. Yeah, there's the the content creative market store. So you can basically open that up directly inside of 3D Max and look for different content that you're looking uh, that you, that you're in need for, and filter that through, etc. So that's that's kind of new to 3D Max 2016 as well. That kind of connection. Brilliant. Let me look through here. Okay, so what else? Um, I want to make sure that we have a little bit of, of time for, for questions and answers in the end. So please get ready and uh, to to send me your, your questions. Uh, what's, what's also new, you know, is the ability to render into the cloud, uh, if I can find it. Yeah, so there's an Autodesk 360 cloud rendering method which you can which you can change to and well, I believe I just froze my, my max but but what it allows you to do is quickly offload some of your Revit files for example into the cloud without worrying too much about super photoreal quality I mean that's not bad but it's certainly not where Corona or V-Ray will take you but just bear in mind you know this is one click it converts your 3 ds Max scene for the cloud, sends it along, and then you can, you know, continue working on your on your objects. And it's rendering out all the cameras that are in your scene. You can adjust them to uh, render either that kind of panoramic view or, um, you know, a print uh, sized rendering, etc. So you can use that. We're in close connection, uh, close touch with Keras Group as well, in order to. Uh, you know, make make kind of that technology available for V-Ray as well. And also one of the, the geek, big new signs in 3ds Max 2016 for that kind of cooperation is that Chaos Group has provided us with their physical camera. And now that physical camera is the new standard camera inside of 3ds Max, but it's opened up to all the different kit renderers. So you can use the physical camera out of Mentoray, for example, right? Uh, so, and you don't have to switch between the standard camera and the V-Ray physical camera whenever you change renderers. You can just maintain your rendering 
um, method by maintaining maintaining the same camera model. All right. So uh, I'm going to open up my, my QA panel, uh, but just so you know, feel free to send me, drop me a message if you have any questions. There's a lot of stuff happening at the moment. You know, there's the new Stingray offering, which is the, the real-time technology developed by Autodesk. It has a direct connection to 3ds Max. It automatically recognizes your materials, your VRM materials, converts them into real-time shaders, and you know, enables you to walk through your scene in yeah, in VR with Oculus or HTC Vive or just uh, on the screen, etc. So uh, again, lots of stuff happening.